Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Lisa Blackburn. This is my YouTube channel for everything I want to talk about science and math. And today we're talking about equilibrium, percent composition, and empirical formula, molecular formula, which is um, unit seven for the, our class at East. Oh, let me find my little right on the board thing. Okay, so take a look at your notes. I'll find mine. Here they are. Okay, number one question. How do reactions occur? And I actually said this last unit, and you have a little picture as a hint. What do you think that it should go there? Collision. Collision, yes. For the reaction to happen, the atoms must come in to, collide. they must collide, they must touch. So this is called collision theory. We have to add a little theory to everything in science, right? It's not just collision. It's collision theory. It's not just atomic. It's atomic theory. You've got to put some theory in it. All right. So there are factors that affect rate of reaction. And we're going to do a few little labs with that, little hands-on things. The labs this time are pretty fun and easy, kind of, kind of interesting little things. Not too, not too chemically e this time. But I am looking to show you a couple of demonstrations that are. All right, so what, are you, what do you think that you, what are some things that you think will react the, affect the rate or just affect a chemical reaction? Say you wanted to speed up a reaction. What do you think you could do to it? What? You got heat or what else? Okay, so you got the first one. You can increase the heat. And this, inc this increases the atom's speed so they collide faster. Remember, this is about collision theory. Also, it could uh, supply the activation energy. That should be a capital E. Um, so we're going to talk more about what that is in a second, activation energy. Okay, so you got one of them. Uh, what else do you think could make it? Uh, I think someone said it. What did you say, Ashley? Those are two different things. One is you can add different chemicals, right? But, and we're going to talk about that later. But also just you could add more of the same chemical, right? Uh, if something's not burning enough, don't you usually put a little more fuel on the fire? One time my dad uh, had, had, had a lawnmower that kept breaking. And so he was very frustrated at it. He had swept up, he had raked up a big pile of leaves um, to burn. And he was so mad at the lawnmower, he put the lawnmower on the pile of leaves, put gas on it, put more gas on it, lit the leaves to just burn up the lawnmower with the leaves. Not smart, because that lawnmower probably had some gas in it. He said it blew up 50 feet in the air. <laughs> he realized it could have killed him after it was airborne. <laughs> he was like, okay, that was dumb. So don't I, I think before you put more fuel on the fire. And people use that expression also like, in an argument, right? Saying more bad things to increase it. So one of the things we can do is we can increase the concentration. We can add more particles. So there's more chance of collision. Okay, we have a little picture over here. There's another one, what can we add? Pressure. If you squish the particles together, they're more likely to collide and they are more likely to react. So we can increase the pressure. Now, in chemistry, capital P is the symbol for pressure. Square brackets are the symbol for concentration. Sometimes H is the symbol for heat. Sometimes it's Q. I don't know why. <laughs> and it lost in the battle of the symbols. Okay. Now, there's another one. Another one, okay? Is it easier to catch on fire, sawdust or a log? Sawdust, because of smaller particles. This is surface area. Surface area. And sometimes that's abbreviated SA, capital S, capital A. And, um, the, and this is the weird thing. Smaller particles have, do you think, a greater or less surface area? Less. Who's all for less? Who's all for more? 
It's more. It's actually, they have a greater surface area per volume. And this is why, anybody got dogs? Ever had a little chihuahua dog? It gets just a little bit cold. What's that dog doing? Shivering. Had a, ever had a great big St. Bernard? Do they ever shiver? No. The bigger that particle or animal, the uh, less surface area per volume. It's a ratio. The smaller the particle, the smaller the dog, the smaller the person, the greater the surface area per volume. So that poor little chihuahua is losing all of its heat through its skin. Where the great big St. Bernard, he's fine. The bigger you are, the less cold you are. Little, little or colder, shivery. So this is the other thing. You, on your drawings, you have a grain silo. Now we live in the east, so we don't know about this much, but people from out west know that you have to be very careful at grain silos. Why? They blow up. They catch on fire. People die. Um, it's a big problem out west because the, pe the farmers will take their grain to be milled. Then there's very, very fine particles. You don't ever worry at Thanksgiving about your ear of corn blowing up in your face and blowing your head off, do you? Does not cross your mind. But corn and all those grains, when they get really, really finely ground, become explosive. Um, one time my kids were, did a science fair thing where they, blew, where they exploded cornstarch. They took cornstarch and blew it at a flame and it makes a big fireball. So, um, of course, it greatly alarmed the other people at the science fair, but mom, the chemistry teacher, was in charge. We knew it was going to be fine. So, but you don't worry about corn exploding, but cornstarch, oh yeah, it can explode. And people die. And so, if you're ever out west and you see the grain silos, there's signs everywhere. No smoking, um, no automobiles that backfire. If your car backfires or your truck backfires, do not drive on this property. And it's all because they're afraid of exploding small size um, surface area. All right, there's one more. And uh, which one do you think is more likely to react? Uh, ethanol or the glass container I put it in? The ethanol. So part of it is just the chemical nature of the substance. And that's why we use certain things in chemistry class and other things we, we use for different purposes. The chemical nature varies from substance to substance. There you are, right? Is it okay for me to scroll? Okay. Now, sometimes you need some energy. It's called activation energy. And remember, big E is energy, activation energy. So if I get out my reaction in the box here, I've got the match. There is plenty of oxygen in this room. How much do y'all know? Do y'all know what percent this air is oxygen? 70. No, we'd all die. It's 20. 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. Generally, that's rounding off. If it was more, then the atmosphere would burn and we would have no life on this planet. How many times do I say that? It's over and over again. So how many, why do we say we breathe oxygen if it's more nitrogen than oxygen? Why don't we we do. Nitrogen? Well, the part that we need to live is the oxygen. Okay. Even so, it's like only 20% of it. And when you breathe in, you're breathing in 20% oxygen. When you breathe out, you breathe out 15% oxygen. So you only uh, use up 5% of the oxygen in your breath. If you breathe the 5% that gets uh, used up, what you breathe out instead is carbon dioxide. If you, it wasn't that ratio, if you did mouth to mouth, you would just kill the person faster. Wow. You, you have to be breathing out oxygen for mouth to mouth to work. Okay, so I got a match. There's plenty of oxygen here. Why am I not afraid that it's not going to just burst into flames? It's this. It's this chart. It's to burn this match. I have the reactants, the match, and the oxygen. 
But for it, for the reaction to start, I have to add extra energy that is called the energy of activation, uh, symbolized E sub A. And it's this extra energy right here. That's what striking the match does. That's what these chemicals plus the friction start, gives it the extra energy it needs to start burning. Now those chemicals are gone. And now the, it's just sustain, sustaining itself is the oxygen reacting with the wooden match. This is the chemical reaction going now. So now we're past the hump. We're down here going toward products. So, and notice usually with our exothermic reactions, and remember the vast majority of reactions are exothermic, then the energy of the products are less than the energy of the reactants. This is what a typical reaction diagram looks like. And that's one of our standards is for you to know this diagram and to be able to label it. So you know this is going to be on the test. It's going to be on the test. All right, next. Next idea, and this um, I think it was somebody already said, is sometimes you need a chemical to get them together. What's that called? A catalyst. Y'all are learning. A catalyst. A catalyst is like a matchmaker. This puts the chemicals together so they can react. An example in your body is enzymes. And do you remember from bi biology class what enzymes are made out of? Protein. Proteins, right. Proteins. All right, any questions about page one? Okay, so adding a catalyst, make, it, make a little note here, increases the reaction rate. So remember, adding a catalyst, these, these chemicals would probably eventually react anyway. Eventually they'd randomly collide and they would react. But by adding a catalyst, the reaction goes much faster. Um, and I have some labs we might do with that too. One of them doesn't work real good though. I need a better one. I'll see if I can find it. All right, it might have just been my peroxide was old. Any questions about catalyst? See, I told you this wasn't too much. Y'all are doing great so far. Okay, so number two, composition. Sometimes it is useful in chemistry to know the composition of a compound in terms of the mass, and in reality we usually use weight. Remember, weight and mass are kind of the same thing on Earth. Um, the mass of the elements in the compound. For example, you, have, you found some copper ore, and you want to know, would it be profitable for you to mine that ore? Or is it worth it? Or would mining it cost too much for the profit? You want to know your profit ratio. So the, the compounds in the mixture of the rock you found in the ground and you want to know what percent copper it is so you can figure out if it's worth it for you to mine it. Does that make sense? If you go to the Villarica Gold Museum right here uh, near us, uh, they said that all of Paulding County has lots of gold in the dirt, that we're all part of what was the Cherokee Gold Belt that goes from Dahlonega on out toward Rock Mart, and that we're right in the middle of it. But it's so spread out. It's not a big old vein of gold. So, you know, it's not worth it. Also, they made it illegal to mine gold in Georgia because, um, you know, we had the first gold rush in America, in Dahlonega, and they started using high-powered water to wash away the mountains to get the gold. And they decided they would rather have mountains than have their land all destroyed by mining. So it's illegal to mine gold in Georgia. You can pan for gold. And I know people who actually make a living panning for gold in Dahlonega. They, they get enough gold out of the streams to make a living. That's pretty, that's kind of cool, isn't it? One of my uh, uncle's brother-in-law, that's how he makes his living, is panning for gold. Um, which it just seems like he should walk around like a little prospector or something. Okay. Uh, like, you know, the guy in Toy Story, the old prospector, Stinky Pete. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay, so copper's in a compound. Is it worth it to mine it? 
So anyway, if you find some, something that looks like gold, it might be gold here. Don't just go, ah, well, what are the chances? According to the Gold Museum, chances are it's gold. Example problems. Okay, so this is not gold. This is not copper. This is a different one. Uh, Carbone C10H14O causes the smell of spearmint. You're like, all we talk about are these mints. Spearmint. Now, spearmint is my favorite mint. I really I like peppermint too, but spearmint is number one. Not so much a fan of the wintergreen that I gave y'all. Um, calculate the percent composition of carbon. So we're gonna find out what percent each um, each element is by mass. Okay. So what you do for these problems, you start off listing the elements vertically just like we did for molar mass. Next, you look and see how many you have, just like we did for molar mass. So we have 10 coppers, 14 hydrogens, and one oxygen. Everybody understand how I got that? Okay. Next, you multiply it, so put dots, by the molar mass. What's the molar mass of carbon? 12. 12. You're memorizing them. Good. What's the molar mass of hydrogen? One. What's the molar mass of oxygen? 16. 16. Isn't it convenient to have these memorized? Okay, 10 times 12 is 120. 14 times 1 is 14. 1 times 16 is 16. Then you add them all together. 150. 150 is your total mass. Let me find my button. So, so far, all we did was we got the molar mass of it. But we did it in a way that we know the molar mass of each part. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So, we have to be neat while we do this math. Okay, next you go down, and for each one, you take its partial mass, and you divide it by the total mass. Let me say it again before I scroll. So like I'm going to take 120, divide it by 150. 14, divide by 150. 16, divide by 150. Everybody follow along? Okay, then I'm going to scroll up and we're going to do it. Okay, so the, the mass of carbon was 120. The mass of hydrogen was 14. And the mass of oxygen was 16. Each of these I divide by the total mass. 150 and multiply by 100 and I get the percent. So what is the percent of carbon? Do it on your calculator. You want to tell me? What? You want to tell I want y'all to tell me. I want y'all to practice this. What's carbon? 80. 80. So you put percent because the number without units is meaningless. What is hydrogen? Nine point three, and notice I want you to put the point three. Don't round off too much. And what is the oxygen? Ten point seven. Ten point. I'm gonna say. Or you, you think it's six or seven? It's ten point six. Six 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 six. So it would round to seven. Okay. Now one way you can check it is add them all up, and they should be close to a hundred. And if it is, that's not the answer. That's the check, but it helps you make sure that you're not crazy off. Add them all up and make sure you get it close to 100. It is 100. It is 100. We did extra good. All right, that's your first kind of problem on the test. Is that easy? Wait, that's it? That's it. That's all you have to do for that problem. So the answers are these percents right here. That's considered the answers, those percentages. Not bad. Okay, let's go on. But it would have been a lot if we had added it to the other test. The other test was already big, right? Very big. Okay, the next thing is empirical formula. Um, an empirical formula is a reduced formula. For example, Hydrogen peroxide, you can divide two into both of those twos, right? So its empirical formula would just be HO. 
It's reduced. That's the empirical formula. So what we're going to do is we're going to, from the percent composition, we can get the empirical formula. And then from the empirical formula, we can get the molecular formula. So that's how we're going to do this problem. It's got two different parts. All right, so let's talk about this. Um, for example, uh, nylon, you know, like nylon rope, nylon backpack, nylon pantyhose. Okay. You know, nylon was one of the chemicals discovered on accident, too, I think. I'm trying to remember, but yeah, they, they, they first started pulling it out of, um, uh, uh, out of a beaker and it was making these long strands and they thought, huh, wonder what you can do with that. Okay, so nylon is made out of 63% carbon. Remember, we're, we always annotate our problems and circle them and make them easier to understand. 12.38% nitrogen. 9.80% hydrogen, and 14.4% oxygen. Calculate the empirical formula for nylon. Now, um, notice I circled what it is with its percent. Because where I mess up is if I'm doing this too fast, and I end up giving the wrong percent to the wrong thing. Like, I'll read it too fast, and I'll give carbon the 12.38. Do you see how I mess it up? Now, so y'all don't do that. Y'all circle it. It don't go so fast. I'm always in a hurry. Got to hurry up. Make this, do this problem. Do something else. So take your time, circle it, make sure you're doing it. Okay. So what you do is you take your percents and you write them down as grams. Now, how can we do that mathematically? How can we just say, we're going to change that unit from percent to gram? And it's this. This nylon it has the same formula whether I have a teaspoon of it or a, or a ton of it. Does that make sense? Water has the same formula whether you have a teaspoon or a swimming pool. It's still H2O. And what we're trying to get is the formula from the percents. So we're going to assume we have a 100 gram sample. Then we can just, because those percents all add, add up to 100, right? So all we have to do is change those to grams, and we have a 100-gram sample. Does everybody understand how I, why I did that? Okay. So next, what you do is you write down your formulas vertically. You write down these as grams, and we're going to change them to moles. So for each one, we make a little railroad track, and we write the molar mass down here. What's the molar mass of carbon? 12. 12 grams per one mole. What's the mass of nitrogen? Y'all learned that one? 14. 14 grams per one mole. What's the mass of, of hydrogen? One. One gram per one mole. And what's the mass of oxygen? 16 grams for one mole. So for each one of them, we divide by our molar mass. So do it. Do 63.68 divided by 12 on your calculator. I'm going to write lots of decimals for this one. Five point, I'm going to do it four decimal points. 302. Now I have moles. Okay. So now do the next one. Did you get 0 0.8 three seven moles of nitrogen and then 9.72 moles of hydrogen and 0 0.8838 moles of oxygen and those are pantyhose over to the side that drawing Pantyhose used to be quite the style, but now they're not, and I'm kind of glad. It was considered immodest to be out without your pantyhose on. Wait, how did 9.80 go to 9.72? Like, oh. did it move? Yeah, it should, uh, 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 because instead of dividing by one, I, and that's what I did, I, I didn't have this as rounded. I did 1.008 because the book did. So do 1.008 grams. 
the book did, and I wanted to use their problem because I liked it that it was nylon. I thought that was interesting. All right, so we're good so far. We've converted it to moles. May I roll it up? Let's just do it a little higher and see if that works. No pick one second. You're going to have to make it go away. Are we good? Okay, now next you do this. And that's why, did I draw Pac-Man at the top of your page? No, you need to draw it at the top of it. So everybody draw uh, Pac-Man. You have a little eyeball. Uh, and which of those answers was the smallest answer? Um, which one is smallest? What? Um, nitrogen. Nitrogen at 0 0.8837. Three, seven. So see, Pac-Man does not want to eat him. He's the less than sign. He wants to eat the greater than. Here are the little dots that Pac-Man's eating. Oh wait, is everybody's still following, right? Okay, now once you figure out which one's the less of those, you take each one and you divide it by the least. Okay, so carbon was 5.302 divided by 0 0.8837, right, is what it was. Okay, and then we do nitrogen, 0.8837 divided by 0 0.8837, and then we do hydrogen, 9.72 divided by 0.8837 and then we do oxygen 0 0.8838 is that one right mm -hmm. divided by 0 0.8837 now this is why you keep a lot of decimal points for this is sometimes it's a little tricky knowing which one is smallest all right so what is 5.302 divided by 0.8836. Round it off to a whole number. Or a half or a third. If you can round it to a whole, round it. What is it? It's six, right. What about this divided by itself? One. What about 9.72 divided by 8837? What is it? Eleven. Eleven. And then these, round it off, is... One. So these are our subscripts. So why is it so this one you round so much and the others you do? Because now we are getting the subscripts. And remember, one of the laws we learned when we learned about writing formulas is the subscripts are never fractions and they're never decimals, they're whole numbers. Okay? So now we can write it. It's C6N. Subscript 1, so we ought to write it. H11 and then O. Now, in reality, you normally write it probably N, C6, H11, O. You usually put C's and H's next to each other, but it doesn't matter. The, the letters in any order is fine because they write them reflecting their bonding, and you don't know their bonding. All right, so how do we feel about that? Okay. Now, these, those are your subscripts, and sometimes you have to multiply so there are no fractions. So if any of these were 0.5, we'd multiply them by two first. If any of these ended up being 0.3 or point six, 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 seven. And um, we would multiply it by three first to get these whole numbers. You can't round too far. It should be close to what it is. And we'll do more worksheets to make it more clear. Once you start doing the problems, it's real easy. You'll see, oh yeah, 0.5. I gotta multiply these by two. All right, next idea. Y'all are doing great. The next idea we've already seen, but we want to put, um, put a name to it, hydrates. And it's that some compounds have water, hydra, hydro, sounds like water, right? Um, they have water in the crystals. 
and the ionic compounds. Example is copper two sulfate. We saw that in lab. In the little evaporating dish, we put it in there. We heat, heated it up. It was blue. Do you remember what color it turned? Whitish gray. So that's what they, we, and what we were doing is we were evaporating the water out of the crystals. And then remember you added water back to it and what color did it turn? Blue and then you threw it away in the trash can. Remember that lab? That was your hydrates. Now, I didn't show you how to write it. Okay, so how you write the, a formula for a hydrate is copper sulfate, C-U-S-O-4, and then you put a dot and then bound into its crystal for every one copper molecule are five water molecules. So it's written like that. In lab it was blue and then it turned to white. So you can color it like that in your coloring if you want to. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, and so we can do percent compositions of hydrates also. Sometimes you will have the um, the, the percent of hydrogen and the percent of oxygen in a hydrate. So it just makes it a little more fun. Okay, the next idea is equilibrium. Now, equilibrium is a bigger idea than, we're, than we are going to cover it. We're going to introduce you to it. There's more to it that you will learn when you come back and take AP Chem from me year after next. So everybody, put down your calendar. You're taking AP Chem from me. Then next year, we don't have enough kids to take it. Not enough kids signed up, so I need y'all to sign up for AP Chem. It'll be great. You'll learn extra chemistry. You'll be so ready for that college chemistry class or the AP exam if you, if you don't, even if you don't like chemistry. You can come back and take AP Chem, take the AP exam, and be done forever and never have to take chemistry again if you're not a science major. There's benefit in that too, right? So anyway, I'm supposed to be trying to sell y'all on the idea of AP Chem. So you would get to learn more equilibrium in AP Chem. We'd get to use some fancy equipment we're probably not going to use called titration apparatus. Um, find the, the point of equilibrium there. All right, so this is the big idea. Some reactions are reversible. And y'all already know this. Y'all are intimately familiar with one reversible reaction. Uh, Carter had his out just a second ago. What is it that you make sure you do every night before bed? You make you're sure your phone is recharged. That's a reversible chemical reaction. And you charge it by running one of the products, electricity, you run it through it backwards and it, re and it restores the chemicals so they're ready to go again. So some reactions are reversible like rechargeable batteries. When they stop going back and forth, and what I mean by that is you, they will end up, instead of going to completion, where every bit of the products turn into reactants, instead, at the end, you are left with a little bit of unreacted products at a certain concentration. And you're also left with some products at a certain concentration. Each thing has a little bit of concentration in the beaker at the end. You don't get 100% products and 0% and reactants. Can you follow that? So when they finish going back and forth, this point is called equilibrium. It's where they settle down to these concentrations is where it decides that's what it's gonna be. Equilibrium. And you, you hear that word equal there. It's all balanced and settled out. Now there's different, there, there's a little bit of different terms that we use here. One is chemical equilibrium. And by um, definition, a dynamic state, which means it can change, which you know, you know that, you can recharge your batteries where the concentrations of all reactants and products remain constant. It can change, but right now it's not changing. It's at an equilibrium. Everybody follow that? This is its technical definition. The next one is there is a, a math formula we can write for this. It is called an equilibrium expression. 
And we're going to be doing that this week. We're going to write this math formula, learn how to write it, and then we're going to learn how to solve it. So an equilibrium expression is a formula, a math formula. A math formula is also called an expression based on concentrations. Remember, square brackets are concentrations. In the balance, you got to have it balanced first, chemical equation that shows how much a reaction goes to completion. Some reactions go a lot more to completion than others. Some will only go a little bit. Some will go all the way where you end up with no reactants left. But this math problem will tell you how much, how much you're going to end up with. Now, there's another thing called an equilibrium constant. A constant. Y'all know what constants are in math. You learned in algebra about direct and inverse variations in math and how you can uh, calculate the constant for those equations. And we've learned other constants, like Avogadro's number is a constant. So we can calculate an co uh, equilibrium constant. It's a value obtained from putting the equilibrium concentrations into the equilibrium expression from the balance equation. 